episode of the live with not the live with Naz. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Laughter for All podcast. I am comedian Nazareth. Thank you so much for joining us for episode number 116. 116. Add weeks to that. That's few, more than two years we started here before the pandemic. So we thank you for joining us. Thank you for subscribing. I want to encourage you to really subscribe. Tell your friends. I think that's the best marketing. If you if you were blessed by any of our episodes, if it helped you, if it answered a question for you, if it if it did anything for you, just uh, you know, be kind, be generous, subscribe, tell your friends about it, share it on your uh, social media. That's the way other people know about it and. Um, they get blessed. So it's not, you know, it's not going to make us any more money or any more famous, but it will help other people. And that's the goal from this Laughter for All podcast. Uh, you know, uh, before I bring our guest, I just want to remind you about the vitamins that I've been taking for almost, what, a year now. And they've been very helpful to me, especially with the inflammations I have. So uh, let's uh, listen to the doctor who he is the CEO of the company, and he's, uh, he tells you more about it. So, all welcome. levels, and also helping and supporting a healthy immune system. And the same products that you would be taking, the Adaptive Stem, um, even Mental Clarity, they have ingredients in there that will adjust cholesterol. They are there to support a healthy cholesterol level in the body. So I mean, it, the beauty behind the the six products that I know that that you have on your probably even on your store, it, you know that you've been introduced to, is uh. that they're very universal. They have the ability to flex in a lot of different directions. You know, I can tell you the Immu Stem. I don't know if you have a bottle of that right there. Yes, but. I do. The Immu Stem is uh, right here. Uh, yes, this one. Yeah. That. That would be that would be something I would definitely put your friend on. That is directed towards balancing blood levels, cholesterol levels, and also helping and supporting a healthy immune system. All righty, that was uh, Dr. Malay. And if you have cholesterol, if you have high blood pressure, if you have inflammations, arthritis, like I do then you can use these vitamins that will help you out. So go to gethealthywithnads.com, get him. And if you put under shipping Nazareth, you'll get free shipping. Yes, my name has some power with UPS and FedEx and the U.S. Post Office. Anyway, right now, I'm excited to introduce a new friend of mine. Uh, this young man, I met him recently. He sent me an email uh, I think last week or the week before, saying that he saw my show and since he started doing comedy. And I looked him up and uh, found out that he's going to be close. He lives close to where we're going to, I'm going to be in Ohio. So we decided that we're going to do a Laughter for All Outreach. Uh, laughter for All Outreach is if you're following us. Uh, laughter for All is a nonprofit ministry I started seven years ago. And the goal from that is to be able to do free comedy nights uh, for people who cannot afford to pay to go see a live concert with music and comedy or just comedy. Uh, so what we did is we prayed about it and God opened the door for us to be able to rent stadiums, sports arenas, churches, uh, you know, big outdoor uh, pavilions and invite people for free. And before the pandemic, we were able to give a thousand bags of food and a thousand toys each event. When we did those events, and we were able to, we we're allowed to do that. So it's really good. So during the pandemic, we were, our hands were, you know, coughed. We couldn't do much. But uh, in February 19th, we're going to be in uh, Franklin, Indiana to do a, a laughter for all comedy outreach where people can come for free, invite their uns friends, unsafe friends, or any friends, anyone who needs a la uh, to laugh. You know, Solomon said there's a time to weep, but there's also a time to laugh. We've done enough weeping. It's time for us to laugh. So if you're in Indiana or near Indiana or anywhere in that area, invite your friends on the 19th 
at Turning Point Church in Franklin, Indiana. But the young man that I'm telling you about, uh, his name is Haas Ridgeway. He has been entertaining groups of all sizes since the 90s, has performed in over 30 states and few countries. He has made audience laughs in clubs, cruises, churches, and large corporations. He used stand-up comedy impressions, crazy sound effects, and musical comedy to bring his unique style of comedy to crowds all over the U.S. He has recorded a dry bar special and is a regular at the Mike Huckabee Show. Let's pray. welcome my new friend, Haas Ridgeway. Hey, Haas, how are you? I'm good. Blessed. How are you doing? Wonderful, wonderful. I think we either look like we're going hunting or we work for the FBI. We're both wearing vests like that. That's right. We are just both getting, I don't know if there's any Kevlar in this or not, but it's awesome. It's warm. <laughs> where, where is Franklin, Indiana? It's right outside of Indianapolis, about 20 miles south. And so it's hard to even see that there's a difference between Franklin and Indianapolis when you head north. You just kind of, there's a few cornfields and then businesses all the way into the skyscrapers. So it's not too far. Really? Uh, the yeah. skyscrapers are in Indianapolis or in Franklin? No, not Franklin, Indianapolis. Yeah. I think, Wonderful. Uh, yeah, there's not too many tall buildings here. Maybe a few downtown, but nothing. Now, you're a comedian, but you're also uh, on staff at, uh, at the church. That's correct. I'm the senior minister at the Turning Point Church here in Franklin. You are the pastor. You are the I senior minister. That's correct. How, is, how does that work with your, you know, you write a new bit and you feel the urge to use it. Does your uh, audience know that, you know, they're... Yeah, the only time that? I... Yeah, the only time I get in trouble for uh, comedy is when I don't use enough. They come up to me and say, now, this week, you didn't use a whole lot of comedy. And I'm like, well, it was Easter. So um, <laughs> maybe we shouldn't have done too much. That. But no, I, I, I sometimes I just make up something on, on the fly. And I remember a few weeks ago, uh, one of the guys in the at our church, he owns a clean comedy club in, in Greenwood. And I, I said something that just off the cuff that was funny. And I... I looked at him and I said, "Write that down." And he just texted it to me right away. So, oh, that's funny. That's a green Greenwood. Come, who's that? Is that what Dennis? It's Dennis and Steve. Yeah, they both go to our church. So, oh, really? Oh, that's yeah. a club. What do you call it? The uh, Gutties. Gutty Gutties Comedy Club. Yeah, it's a clean comedy club. Uh, yeah, they got one there, and then they have one in Minnesota. Yes, yes, yes. I was invited to there in May, but. With the schedule, it was uh, very difficult to be able to to do that. But uh, one day I will do that. I love Dennis. I, I don't know the other gentleman, but Dennis uh, is really a good guy. Now, if if you have to choose between pastoring and doing full time stand up comedy, what would you do? I'm sorry, this the connection is bad. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I can't, <laughs> yeah, right. I can't yeah, choose. Right. It's kind of like asking me to choose between Star Wars and Star Trek. Can't I like both? You know. Um, I've, I've chosen to do both, uh, for the last, I don't know, 18 years, there's been opportunities just to go and do comedy. Um, but you know, we've always wanted to be tethered to a church, but that sounds bad, but I, I, I mean that in a, in a good way, you know, that we can be a part of a church. Uh, what's easier for you prepare a sermon or, uh, perform comedy? Oh, well, I, I would go right. with, uh, what's easier is, um, uh, probably comedy at this point but it, when i first did comedy i would have been like i'll write 10 sermons to one joke because that's you know you, i get nervous about is this going to be funny are there going to be a reaction but um so i think that you know right now comedy is just you know because i've had so many reps it feels really natural you know um but i enjoy both uh now as far as how did you start doing comedy oh man I mean, so is it professionally or whatever you know what i mean right well i i've done a few little uh gigs here and there and um and i i just kind of did them for nothing you know and there's few people that paid me but i was just doing it because i love to do it and then in the early 2000s i was in nashville tennessee and um i i had really not had any experience with christian comedy i, I knew that it existed out there but i hadn't been around it and then all of a sudden you know, the banana series came out, came out where I saw you and many other guys. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. And I'm at, at dinner at a Ruby Tuesdays in Nashville, Tennessee with a bunch of youth ministers. And 
in in the i'm just making them all laugh the whole time and they said you're going on stage tonight i'm like i'm not going on stage tonight sonic flood is going to be on stage tonight there's no oh, way i remember <laughs> yeah i'm like i'm not going to be on stage there's sonic flood coming and and they told the mc that i was a professional comedian and uh i'd only done little bitty things uh you know told basically dad jokes or sermon jokes and he got up and said hoss ridgeway the comedian's going to do 10 minutes while we're waiting on sonic mm -hmm. flood to show up and so i go i just remember those three steps and i said it's now or never you know and i just right. gave him 10 minutes of chris farley if he was your preacher you know and and, and just did oh this whole that's sermon. funny yeah and i was like let me tell you a little bit you know and i did the whole thing <laughs> and and i've been booked all over the country ever since it, oh, that's it, amazing. Because it was a youth minister's conference, so everybody's a, an event planner that was in the room. So right, right. That was pretty crazy, yeah. Man, did you did you know when you went up on stage, did you know that you, what you were going to do, or it was just like, boom? Oh, well, it. right before, I looked at my friends, and I was like, what am I going to do? And they said, just do what you did at Ruby Tuesdays. And I was like, um... You mean eat a lot? You know, and they're like, <laughs> no, do this. The, the sermon is Chris Farley. And I was like, okay, I'm doing it. And I walked up those steps and I just started in and, uh, and it was pretty cool. And, and they asked me to stay on stage because they had a little time of worship and they wanted me to work on a potter's wheel. And they did a close up video in front of everybody because they're trying to prove that, you know, not everybody can do that. It takes the master to do that. And I knew that's what they wanted, but I, they didn't know that my wife owned a ceramic store with a pottery wheel. And I knew what I was doing. So oh, I, yeah. So I intentionally messed it up after I got it way up there and made this, you know, bowl. And then I was like, I let it, you know, put my finger in it, and then it went all crazy. And I was like, okay, that that is crisis averted, you know. So well, that's that's funny. So your wife owns a ceramic. Uh, she did. She did it several years ago. Yeah, she, we had a brick and mortar place where people came and painted pieces and worked on the wheel and that kind of stuff. So, it's kind so of fun. you you got booked by these youth pastors. You yeah. started going. Did you start like working, writing more, trying Absolutely. to come up with? Yeah, I it, came did, home and I told my youth group, I was like, guys, I did some comedy at this thing, and now I'm flying to Denver in three weeks. You know, <laughs> to do a show. <laughs> And I was like, I got to start writing this, this set. And, and they started saying like, oh, you should tell the story you told at this youth rally. And the next kid's like, you should tell this story at, that you told us last week. That was funny. And all of a sudden, they helped me develop my first set from illustrations and stories from my own life that they liked. And wow. so, and I just kind of embellished those stories, you know, a little bit. And, you know, how we do in comedy and, uh, but but there's truth to almost every story that I tell, um, you know, with, with jokes written for them. And so, yeah, they helped me develop the first, you know, 30 minute set that I had. Did you get to a point where you say that, you know what, this is becoming uh, more prof uh, more full time. This is, you know, this is, there's money in it a lot more than pastoring. Did yeah. you, did you get to that like fork of the road and you had to make the decision to, yeah, both or in 2009, I was a youth minister down in Florida. And in that year, I think I had 35 shows and and it was it was a lot for, you know, to be a full time youth minister and that. And so my wife and I talked about it, like, do do I just go and do this? And and she was like, you know, um, just worried about the stability of stepping out of a salary and health insurance and all the things that, you know, as a minister you get. And so I guess we decided that while my daughter was still at home and which developed into, I don't really want to leave uh, ministry. Um, we just worked it out to where Friday and Saturday I can go do comedy. And, um, you know, as long as I'm back on Sunday and if I have to be gone on a Sunday, I take a week's vacation and just enjoy the area. So he, you know that's a that's a that's a blessing from God, Haas. I'll tell you Amen. why. Because I know a lot of comedians and have worked with a lot of comedians in thirty years, and 
some of them had to make that decision, but the other decision, you know, uh, do I jump into full time doing what I love? And I'm just, just uh, not just comedy. I mean, I'm talking musician, I'm talking artist, uh, actor. Do I jump into this full time or do I keep my day job that will limit me from even doing comedy? But in your case, you can still do comedy. You can still yeah. uh, perform in the week, you know, and we can still keep your job and keep your insurance because that's a hard thing to do. So that's that's a great decision. Now, uh, where were you born, uh, Haas? Where or when? <laughs> I was, where? I was born in Virginia. And uh, huh. I was almost born in, in San Diego. My my dad was in the Navy at the time. And and uh, mm. at eight months pregnancy, my mom traveled across the country back to where family was. And I was born in Virginia. Oh, you could have been a Californian. I know. I was that close. <laughs> I can I can wear club. a T-shirt. I can wear a T-shirt that says "Made in California," but that's about Made all I can do. <laughs> Nowadays, that's that's not a good thing, but that's no. fine. <laughs> no. So, so you were born, and when did you feel like, oh, I'm funny? So, my brothers, my old two older brothers, were probably the funniest people I'd ever met. You know, and my little brother was probably the best actor I'd ever seen. And so here I was in the middle. And everybody thought, because I was a giant, you're going to play football, you know? And of course, I didn't have the football meanness, but um, I found myself getting made fun of a lot. And so in grade school, I I would go home and I would listen to records from uh, clean comedians like Jerry Clower and then uh-huh. uh, and another guy um, that did this thing called a Phone Call from God. You remember that comedian? Oh, this, yeah. Jared no. or... No, Dennis, Dennis Jerry. Uh, no, his name's Jerry. Oh, oh, Jerry Crawley. Uh, Jerry something Crawley. Yeah. Well, there's Jerry Clower, but then this guy is another guy. But anyway, he he had this record called "Phone Call from God," and it was just to me as a middle schooler, I thought it was the funniest thing I'd ever heard. <laughs> and so every day I'd go home and I'd listen to these records with the big headphones, and mm-hmm. then I memorized little things that they would say. And I found that if I go to school and I'm the funniest guy in the room, no one makes fun of me. And so I became the class clown. And, you know, when the teacher would say something, I would finally go, oh, my brother said this the other day. And everybody laughed and I would say it. And then everybody would laugh and I'd be like, man, this works. And suddenly I'm in control of the laughter. No one's laughing at me. They're laughing because of me. And I thought that's this is awesome, you know, and and I've always stayed up late on Saturday night to watch, you know, Weekend at the Improv. And I never forget, I saw Jeff Jenna at the weekend, the improv. And then I've worked with him like four times now. And I'm like, I saw you and I hate to say it, but when I was a kid, you know, on my little black and white screen, that was like 13 inches, you know, in my room. And um, when I'm supposed to be asleep right before the national anthem, you know, so. um, (laughs) Yeah. Oh, you know, so uh, people think that if you're a tiny kid, you're smaller, you're the one who get bullied, but you said you're a big guy yeah. and you were big in school, six, four, you're six, four now. I'm six, four. Yeah. And by, yes. by eighth grade, I was like uh five eleven, and I weighed about two eighty. I was just a big guy. And, and you um, still were bullied. Yes, absolutely. Oh, that's interesting. It, it's so funny. I remember the first time a bully hit me, <laughs> I, I had never been hit before and I was on my paper route of all places and I had made fun of him. Remember I'm getting that quick witted thing, trying to work it out. He destroyed my pumpkin in our front yard and he comes to the house and out on the front street, he says, you like what I did to your pumpkin? And man, before I could think, I said, yeah, it looks more like you. (laughs) Oops. I guess that's bully for chase me into the house because he did, you know. But the next day he shows up on my paper route and everybody's telling me that he'll he'll hurt you. He'll knock you out with one punch. And I'm in seventh grade, you know, for the second time. Anyway, um, <laughs> and, I'm just, <laughs> and I'm sitting there and he's he's like bowing up and I'm, I'm like a head and shoulders taller than he is. And and I'm I'm the only one scared. He swings and hits me in the face. And this instant, I remembered all that fear gave me this adrenaline and I felt nothing. And I just remember looking at him going. You think that hurts? And of course, <laughs> his face crumples up because I didn't know what had happened. I didn't know I was a bleeder, you know, because all of a sudden I feel like this warm sensation. And I was like, oh, I'm bleeding. Anyway, and he 
he ran, he took off. And I was like, wow, I thought that was going to be worse than it was. And, um, oh, but I hated you that nice. stuff. Right. I know. <laughs> I hated that stuff. I've, you know, I just never wanted to fight anybody. And I, I used to throw people around and until the teacher got there, you know, I'll keep looking like they don't hear this. Everybody's yelling fight. You know, it's like somebody <laughs> save me. And all along, I probably could have hurt somebody, but I didn't have that in me. So now you mentioned you, you did seventh grade twice and <laughs> yes, you said you, you, and you dropped out of high, uh, you know, high school, right? I did in ninth grade. I, I repeated a couple of grades growing up just because I was ADHD and no medicine and, and I didn't really focus on anything. I'd rather, again, make everybody laugh than do a, and the assignment. And so in ninth grade, I just got tired of being made fun of. I went to two different schools trying to get away from it. And it just was like, it intensified at, at the second school I went to. And I knew I turned 16 and at the end of ninth grade, which, you know, most people do not turn 16 in ninth grade, but I did. And I, I just walked in and dropped out of school. And, and in Kentucky, if you get a driver's license, you have to work for the state if you drop out in order to keep your driver's license. So I was suddenly signed up for the summer youth program. <laughs> I'm weed eating on the by the railroad tracks on this, you know, big fence next to the health department in the middle of summer thinking. This is not what I always wanted to do. This is I mean, I wanted to be a minister in kindergarten and I wanted to be a comedian you know, the rest of the time. And I'm thinking, what do I need to do? And um, I went to a summer camp you can like this. I went to a summer camp called Future Preachers Training Camp in Nashville, Tennessee. Wow. And I was, you know, a, a counselor, but I was also, they let me preach. And while I, when I preached, um, the uh, a representative from a school in Montgomery, Alabama, a Christian college there, he was there and he said, you know, if you get your GED, we'll give you the preaching scholarship and it's full tuition. Wow. And so I went home and I took a math class at the adult learning center and I spent the whole next year trying to become, you know, finish school through GED. And I taught myself everything and almost got a perfect score on the GED. And then I went to college on my own at 17 in Montgomery, Alabama. My parents didn't even go down to the school. They never saw the school. I went by myself for two years. I was there just me. And um, now I have a master's in Bible. So, I mean, wow. it's, it's, I mean, my first year, I don't, I think I majored in ping pong, like don't get me wrong, because <laughs> I was 17 and, you know, 12 hours from home, but I, um, you know, now I have a master's and I've been in ministry, you know, since 92. And I mean, it's just, the rest is history, I guess you could say. So, uh, Going from a, a high school dropout to getting <laughs> right. a master's in Bible. Right. And uh, what do you say to people who right now sitting, oh, I should have finished college. I should have finished this. I should have done this. What do yeah. you what do you say to them? You know, if if it doesn't like like financially, if it doesn't like hurt your family, you're worth the investment. You know, there was such a feeling of accomplishment when when. Uh, of course, I did mine online, my master's, and when it came in the mail, and I'm just like, I'm walking back from the the mailbox going, you know, in in 1990, I dropped out of high school. You know, I mean, I just, there was, I was a statistic, and I just changed all of those statistics, you know, and just just everything that I learned across along the way, it, it was such a great investment in my whole, in my own life, and and I'm just saying, like, you are worth the time that you put in to better yourself. You know, not everybody needs a degree. Not everybody has to go to college. If you're successful already, stand on those shoulders of your life. You know, don't you don't have to do that. But if you want to do something like that and you have the means to do it, it's a wonderful accomplishment. That's great. You're worth the investment. That's yeah. that's in anything, people. You know, people are listening and watching. That's that's worth it in in everything. Uh, you are worth the investment to to maybe go train for something, do this yeah, or try absolutely. that, and all that. As Sarah's asking, when did you be being your personal relationship with Jesus Christ? When did you begin your personal relationship with Jesus Christ? All right. Well, we'll we'll back out and kind of do the you know 
bird's eye view and come into it. But I was a preacher's kid, you know. Uh, matter of fact, I have three brothers. Um, so there's four of us, and the three of us are preachers. And my other brother is a disappointment. No, I'm just kidding. He's not. He's, <laughs> uh, he's, he's awesome. He's a surveyor. He's, he, we talk every, almost, almost every day. But uh, so I'm a preacher's kid. And, you know, when I'm eight, I wanted to be baptized like everybody else. And so I went to my mom and asked her how to answer my dad's questions so that he would baptize me because I wanted to take communion and lead singing at church. And I didn't have a relationship at that point. Right. It was just I did this so I could do this. And so I went uh, I went to college at 17 and I'm I'm all the way from home and I'm sitting there at a devotional one night and it just hit me that I'd done everything in church to be approved by other people and, and, and to, you know, for people to look at me or let me do stuff. Right. It wasn't because I wanted to surrender um, to his amazing grace. Right. It wasn't any of that. I had never really committed. A matter of fact, a girl had broken up with me because she said there was no love in my relationship with God. It was just, you know, I'm going to do all these rules and and do all that. Mm -hmm. And I just, I knew that I really had never committed my life to Christ and I had never uh, owned my own faith. It was always, my dad's a preacher, you know, Um, Mm -hmm. my uncles are preachers, you know, everybody was in ministry. My great grandparents went to church. I mean, that's what, I mean, you're supposed to do. And so at four o'clock in the morning, I went to one of my friend's rooms and I knocked on the door and I'll never forget. uh, James answers the door and I said, bro, I need you to baptize me. And he says, how? Because he came up to my chest. <laughs> you know, he just looked up and he's like, how? He's making a joke. He thought I was messing with him. And so we went to the church building at four in the morning and we passed a singing group that was practicing in the in the laundry room. And they were like, what are you doing? And I said, I'm going to get baptized right now. And they're like, we're going with you. And they're like, so uh. we walk, walk over and listen, they sang the song, Step into the water, water. oh that's Wait funny. Out a little bit. while i went into the baptistry it was amazing i can't and that night i knew i get chills thinking about it, but i knew that i was committing my life to him and and not using him for my own personal you know lifting me up mm. so. but you know what this is funny because sometimes God does that, those little extra things like, oh, let's get the choir at four in the morning ready. So <laughs> yeah. when he goes, it's kind of special. It's <laughs> more than like, just, yeah. He's like, so then, Gabriel, watch this. Look, when they turn the corner, oh, see, they're practicing. And it was crazy. It's just oh, God's good, that. right? Now, let me ask you this. Um, sure. Your dad was in the Navy. Yes. Uh, it probably he was a serious guy, was yeah, he? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I wrote a book a few years ago called You're So Funny, Daddy, Learning How to Communicate with Your Children Using Humor. And part of uh, we did a survey and we asked parents and we found out that uh, comedy leaves a legacy. So if your father was funny, then the kids are funny. But if the father is serious, we found out that half of the children were military style like their parents, but the other half deliberately attempted to be funny. Now you're saying your two other brothers were funny. That's very yeah. interesting because at home I'm done, you know, for a dad being a military Navy and also a preacher, that right. was a lot of serious, uh, seriousness at home. Right. Yeah. And, and my oldest brother is probably the, the most serious and I, I make fun of him, call him the chosen one and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. you know, he, he's a little bit different than me. I mean, I, he's, I mean, these are my favorite people in the world and my brothers. And so, you know, he was probably the most serious and the rest of us were just trying to, you know, I mean, my dad, he was very strict, but mm. at the same time, he, he liked to laugh and, mm. you know, he had moments where he was like, uh, remember the, the, the strike of the comedians in the late eighties. Yeah. And that's when I was telling dad, I want to do comedy dad. And he's like, 10,000 comedians are out of work and you're trying to be funny, you know, and, um, <laughs> And later on, he's like, you know, I said those things to you and I shouldn't have, you know, um, he, he actually watched the movie. I can only imagine. And um, which was pretty incredible. He was never right. mean. Like he wasn't bad to me. He was a great dad, you know, but he was he was not getting behind those kind of dreams. And he he, he and I had a great conversation after that movie to say, hey, I should have encouraged you, you know. Um, because God has gifted you in a different way than he's gifted me. Cause he, 
that was the big, you know, um, different difference between us was, you know, my dad has to have for preaching, he has to have like 10 pages of notes and I just need my PowerPoint, you know, and because mm. those things came easy to me to memorize things and like to be in a musical and plays and I could remember, be off book in just a few weeks. And my dad, it took him hours and hours and hours and he thought I was just winging it. But it turns out that's just how God gifted me. And and we've had that conversation. So it's it, pretty cool. You know, you know uh, I know this is a laughter for all podcasts, but you're a pastor. Yeah. What kind of challenges you guys go through? I mean, I know because I'm surrounded. I have with pastors, friends. Yeah. But uh, people don't know. People are watching. What kind of what kind of challenges you guys go through as a, as pastors? You know, probably one of the biggest challenges that I've faced my entire life is that, um, you know, when people get upset by even just a perception of what has happened or what they think you might have said, uh, they can they come at you hard. You know, they they. They use their words and they, they even raise their voice. And one of the challenges that I've had that I knew I needed to do was I couldn't respond in the way that people came at me um, mm. because it's kind of like football on TV. It's not the first guy that throws a punch that gets the, the penalty. It's the second guy, you know. And so if I respond in kind and Jesus said not to, right, if I respond in kind, that's all they're, the other people in church are going to hear. You you can't believe what Haas said to me. He was so angry. And he, I was like, well, what did you do? You know, like, how did you go to Haas? You know, they won't ask that. <laughs> right. And so that's one of the challenges. Another, another challenge is um, just that we're real. And we're people, you know. I mean, I, I've got struggles like everybody else. Um, my family has struggles. My daughter has struggles, you know. Um you can paint all the pictures you want on on Facebook, you know, and, and believe me, I'm part of doing that. They, everybody's smiling on Facebook, but we all have those things and we need time when when our family needs us. You know, we need time to be able to do that. And sometimes, you know, people get mad because you couldn't be somewhere because you were being somewhere for your family. And everybody has to remember that, you know, and I want to be with somebody who's hurting, you know. I want to be with people who need me and, uh, but my, my family needs me too. And I think that's one of the biggest struggles of being a pastor. How did the, the COVID impacted you and your family financially? Well, um, my wife was a insurance salesman at uh, Allstate and didn't meet her quota <laughs> because nobody was changing anything. Everybody was worried. And so they let right. her go. And then uh -huh. like six of my biggest shows were all canceled. And, you know, there was, that was always my bonus money was going somewhere to do comedy. So pretty much right. all of the, from, I guess, March of 2020, that rest of that year, I don't, I don't think I made any money on comedy. Maybe, I did a few shows for a hundred or two hundred dollars here or there or whatever, but right. it was it was difficult. And um, and you know, my wife it took her a long time. Everybody's saying everybody's hiring, and of course she couldn't find one. And and so you know, we had to live off credit for a long time. So it it it, it takes a while to you know crawl back out of those holes that that, that you're in, you know. But um, I think that that it. God is still, you know, I mean, he still blessed us. I mean, I'm not saying financially. We we were drawn together during that time, you know. Mm. And, and um, of course, I had to learn to become a televangelist overnight, right? <laughs> so, right. you know, Zoom. preaching, yeah, preaching to a camera without any response from anybody on the other side, that's a hard thing to do. Everybody goes, where's all the jokes? And I'm like, there's no one to laugh. You know, so I'm like not telling jokes. I'm just teaching the sermon and being done, you know. So that's, true. that's, that's some of the struggles there. But I, I have a question from Michael Romero. It says, as a comedian, if you're having a bad day and you have a show, is it hard to be funny? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, there's been times like there's an open mic at Gutty's every Monday night and everybody's trying to do their clean stuff. And there's been times where I've had a bad day and, and they're texting me, are you coming to the club to do you know open mic and i'm like i don't know if i can be funny today you know mm. and but when i have a show it's like oh they're 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 depending on me and so i just 
I try to get where I'm going early and I try to be get some alone time and and just you know just remember that old adage that the show must go on you know um and and as soon as people start laughing it's like healing to my soul right and you, it, laughter is the best medicine even if it's somebody else's laughter for right. me right and if i'm making you laugh man for the next hour if i'm doing an hour show i have forgotten about all my problems and I'm just in in the zone of my comedy and, and my jokes and the stories I'm telling. And it's it's pretty cool. You know, it's interesting because, uh, it, you know, comedians, you know that. But some people who don't do comedy is like when you're on stage, you're on this uh, flea or fight mode because your yes. endorphin is kicking in. Absolutely. And just imagine uh, you see people in a in a, an earthquake or a fire or something. And they see a loved one that's already, boom, maybe had no hope. They died. You still have to run. You still have yeah. to get away. Yeah. So your mind goes into, I need to survive. And that's the same thing when you're on stage. You're in survival mode. So you're not thinking about what happened. I remember the day my dad died and the day my son was born. I Two hours later, I had to be on stage. Wow. And you go into automatic pilot like you do, we do yeah. when we... When we just want to get the show, okay, let me just, you know, I can't, I can't be in a moment right now, but I'm going to give him, you know, the material. But uh, now you, you know, I'm sure a church is a comfort zone when you do comedy in a church, but when you go to do a corporation or a club, how do you, yeah. how do you, how do you change your act to fit that? I actually don't change anything. Um, uh, I had to learn something over the pandemic because the only place I could really do anything was open mic. And, and then I would, I got a few opportunities during that to be at gutties to headline and, and feature for other comedians and to small crowds. Cause nobody wanted to go out. And, and so I learned how to, to the only difference is, is like at a church, you can kind of ramble on in a joke and everybody's going to give you some grace. You can give a little extra details and, but at, at a club, they're about word economy. And so it's, I got to get to the punch faster or I'm going to lose this audience. And so that's the only difference. It's not about content because uh, I'm, I mean, even though I'm a, you know, a Christian man, a minister, my, my comedy is just good, clean comedy. It's not, Hey, how about that Moses guy? He's a real basket case or something, you know, that's a terrible dad joke. But anyway, um, yeah, no. <laughs> it is terrible. <laughs> it is. But I mean, I'm not going to tell, I don't tell very many of those jokes. Um, and yeah, so that's the only difference is, is like I tightened it, everything up and threw away all the extra words. And, and, you know, like Taylor Mason one time told me, he said, I opened for him at, at Harding university. And he said, come to New York, open for me. And you only got like five minutes tops. And I was like, whatever. And then I did a club and I was like, I only have six minutes. He was close, you know, So because <laughs> I'm doing a 45 minute show everywhere else. And I, I, I lose them if I did all of the stuff that I was doing before. So Right. Right. Now, uh, what do you call it? So do you sometimes when you're doing a corporation or a club or a cruise, do you tell them you're a minister? You know, it depends. Like the other day I did a, a show in Ohio and at an Elks club. <laughs> so it oh. was supposed to be a clean show. Like that's why I signed up for it. You know, I was headlining and the opener, a great guy. I love this guy. He, he was not clean that day. And I'd never mm -hmm. heard him do some of the stuff that he did. And I was like, wow. And, uh, I actually told the lady that was introducing me. I said, don't, or the comedian, female comedian that was introducing me. I said, don't, don't tell him I'm, I'm a minister. Let me just show him. You know what I mean? Like I'll, I'm going to be who God called me to be because I think it'll, it would really make them uncomfortable after hearing what they had heard. Does that make sense? I'm not yeah. ashamed of it, you know? And when people came up to me and it came out in the middle of my comedy, you know, I would say that I'm a minister and, and that kind of stuff. Cause I did the, I'm a minister and my brother's a minister and one's a disappointment joke. And you know, it landed and everybody's like, you really a minister, you know? And like, yeah. And so that was pretty cool. But but yeah, I mean, I everybody knows by the time um, my show is over that that I do that. Any embarrassing shows you remember? Not just bombing or something, but I mean, something happened. Yeah. Uh, okay. So a friend of mine, he said, my dad's church called and they want you to do the seniors banquet. 
And I was like, oh yeah, that'd be great. Cause I did one seniors banquet and it went well. I mean, I started the joke with, I can tell this is a seniors banquet because the stool that you provided for the comedian even has a doily on it, you know? And, <laughs> and so I'm at this, I, I show up and brother, half the people were in wheelchairs and not home. If that makes any Ooh, sense. Yeah. And I'm like, well, the staff that was serving lunch was loving my show. Everybody else clueless, no. you know? So it was just hard to do a whole show. And I'm like, they've already given me a paycheck. I've got to do this show and they're not getting my jokes, you know? And and okay. now that I've been doing it for a lot longer, I know how to act at those audiences. I know what stories to tell. So. Right. I didn't remember. That day. Yeah. I know. And I remember the last, uh, not to make you feel bad, but the last show I did a long time ago for seniors, I would tell the joke and then I'm, I'm, I'm going in the second joke and they're just telling each one like what they missed. They're still going over the first joke. So yeah. I learned to be quiet and repeat the joke and all that. But that's, uh, yeah. Any, any, any times or travel times where things were crazy? Something funny, horrible, embarrassing. Well, um, you know, <laughs> one of the one of the inter most interesting interesting shows that I ever did was um, I was I was asked by the future business leaders of America in West Virginia at their mm. convention to do comedy, and so I flew to West Virginia, and um, my brother was in Ohio, so he came down and picked me up, and so we went to the show together. And I walk in the auditorium and, and there's only like six kids. And I said, what, am, am I that early? They said, no, we made it optional. <laughs> and I was like, ah, oh, really? And so I'm up there doing my first few minutes, my intro, and they're all on their phones. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm just going to have to make this a dress rehearsal for my next show because uh -huh. they've already gone to their phones. But what I found out in the next 10 minutes was this they were texting all their friends saying he is funny you should get over here and they started running in and they filled the room it was so oh cool. that's but amazing it, but at the beginning it was like um you know if i had given up just by the people that was in the room that wouldn't have happened you know they would have said you're right he stinks don't come you know <laughs> and then one time i did a show in west virginia also in west virginia at uh in morgantown there was this thing called soul fuel and there was like uh, David Crowder and uh, Colton Dixon and Mary Mary, all these Christian bands. Yeah. And my face was on the poster too, you know. And I was like, I which one does not belong? You know, anyway, um, <laughs> it was an outdoor event. And I know you you know as a comedian what outdoor events are like. I've done festival. I'm doing one again yeah. this year too. Yeah, I know what you're saying. But they're hard because you have to read faces because you can't hear the laughter. It escapes, you know. And and it was 98 degrees. And there was Ouch. no shade and we're all dying out there. And I'm thinking this is the worst thing. Um, and it wasn't well attended. And, you know, I come off stage and I'm thinking nobody cares that I'm even here. And I look at my booth and my poor wife and daughter are slinging shirts because the line is really long. Everybody bought yeah. stuff. It was like, Praise okay, God. it did work. Yeah. But there's been moments where I think this is the worst moment. And then it turns out to not be. I mean, I I, I don't I, I had my guitar break on a trip one time, and I I show up and I get to that part and I didn't even tune it because I was like I just played it yesterday, you know, and I grab the guitar, I put it on. And I notice that not everything's connected, <laughs> so that big twenty minutes of my show was gone. I couldn't do any of the oh. musical comedy, and I was like, oh, and and I and the teens were there. They were doing a prom you know an alternate to a prom it was a christian school yeah a christian alternate prom yeah they're dressed in prom dresses and tuxedos and i'm in a t-shirt and jeans and they're like Ooh. you should probably go home but the food was good so that was awesome. <laughs> no uh what do you call it um as a pastor as a comedian where do you see our country now where where are we uh, what what do you think you know i think that that um that we just filled our lives with everything else and we don't know how to fit God in when he should have been the foundation of everything that we do. And I think that, you know, I watched as a youth minister for 20 years and, um, you know, with, like when I was a kid, I used to say there, there was no travel baseball when I was growing up. 
turns out I just wasn't good enough for travel baseball, but <laughs> there was some, but you know, they, they didn't do Sundays. They didn't do Wednesday nights because we had Bible class and, and, and now it's like they could care less that, um, that we're trying to worship our creator. Um, they, we just fill our lives and we think that our kids have to have all this extra stuff. And I'm not trying to be judging all those people, but I'm just saying like, we've gotten it backwards in the sense that, you know, it's like that old story about the jar and had all these, you know, rocks and gravel and sand and how do you put it all in? It's like, you put the big stuff in first, right? Otherwise it all don't go in. So God has to be first as the foundation. And I think we've lost that. I think we, we also have no, you know, we use this word tolerance all the time. And, and, and I've, I've really discovered that the word tolerance is just another way to disguise hate, you know, Mm -hmm. because I mean, what, how would you rather me talk about you? Like, you you know, Naz, right. And I'm like, yeah, I tolerate him. You know, (laughs) that doesn't sound good, but they say, you, you know, Naz. And I go, yeah, I appreciate him. Then you go, okay. So I learned to appreciate people. I think we've, we've gotten to this thing where it's like, you know, uh, everybody wants everybody else to accept who they are but they're not willing to do that for anyone else. You know, they're not ready to find middle ground. And I think that's what's really hurting our country is that, you know, if you don't agree with two major things on someone else, then you won't agree with anything, even if it's a good idea. And I'm like, we've messed up, you know. Do you do you ever feel that you need to write political stuff or perform political stuff? Or like, oh, you're so frustrated. Do you want to go on stage and say it? You know, there have been times. uh, I just stay away from it just because, you know, I I want everybody to shut that part off of their brain for the the next hour, you know? Right. I don't want anybody to be like, I don't know where he's going to go with this, you know? And so I I just stay away from it. And um, I mean, even if I know that it's a safe room, you know, I may have made a mask joke or something and. One time I, I talked about diabetes and, and, and I said, you know, my doctor told me I had borderline diabetes and I was like, oh, border, let's build a wall around it, make McDonald's pay for it. And so that's about as political as I got. So. Okay. I, I know what you're saying. Like eh, we feel as comedians, we're Christians and we're frustrated with sometimes with all this attacks, but at the same time we're going, what is my job? I'm called to encourage and lift people up and entertain yep. them. And it just kills you. But uh, have you ever done jokes where you felt your own congregation might not like it, but you still did it? Because you, uh, believe, as a comedian, you want to say what you feel. You know, there, there are, so, I mean, I have some like seventh grader humor comes out, you know, I have a song that, that I do. That's a parody of, um, when you say nothing at all, and it's when you uh, when you hear nothing at all, it's about flatulence, you know. So oh. I've had people hear that song and go, "Why did you do that?" You know. So I get that. I mean, it's like, uh, but I, I try to just I just don't write that stuff, you know. I write, yeah, just you know. I mean, I have there's been dark things that come to my mind. Like I was with a bunch of kids one time, and they said. Uh, I said, Hoss, you're a giant. You should be a superhero. And I said, I can't be a superhero. My parents are still alive. <laughs> and um, it's a brilliant joke, but I don't want to use it because what if somebody's parents aren't alive and they're in the room oh. and they're dealing with that right then? I just don't want to, I don't want to do that to them. That's hard. Uh, now, in your comedy, you use, you use stories, you use music and you use uh different what do you call it, sounds and all sound that? effects yeah sounds effect is that something that you've done when you were little and that you oh yeah through? like well you know it all started when police academy came out now oh this, yeah that guy remember yes and i was like that's my hero and i mean like i thought about this like of course i saw all my shows my dad recorded them off of uh tbs and on v- VHS, you know, so we had to fast forward through the commercials and there were no cuss words or nudity or anything like that in the, in the movies we watched because they were all recorded off TV. So I've seen things that I probably shouldn't have watched if it was the, the original cut, you know, but I, I saw him and I was like, man, I can do that. You know, and I remember messing with my dad sitting in the back seat, and he went a little bit over the speed limit. And so I was like, oh yeah, I can whistle without 
puckering up. So I was like, and my dad slams on the brake. You know, it's like, you know, and I'm like, this is awesome. And I learned all that from watching that guy. I was like, if, if a human voice can make that sound, I'm going to figure it out. And so oh, that, I, that's what I've been doing all my life, you know. Mentioning TBS and watching stuff, you just shot your dry bar comedy. How was that? It was it was a great experience. Um, I I did it back last May. It takes a long time to come out because they were doing like six comedians every weekend for you know a year, and so there's that's a lot of people to edit. Um, you know they treat you like a king. You do two sets in one night, two different audiences, and they kind of pick the best one or mesh the two together to make it a good show. And um, man, it was it was wonderful. I was I felt like I was on fire, and it was you know all the adrenaline is going, and and it was great. And I'm looking forward for it to come out like somewhere around May or June this year. They said. Did you have Did you have a full audience in both shows? I did. I did. It was oh. just like two weeks after they started letting people back in. And it was oh. just like right on the, I mean, cause like two weeks before they were at tables and separated. And yes. so my week was the first, like one of the first weekends back where everybody was, That's you know, I, I did it before the pandemic. So I had full audience. It was great. But then my son did it when they had tables. Oh last yeah. Year. So they had tables and there were like 30, 40 people in each show, a uh, less than 40 people actually. So they're going to edit it and it's coming out in this April. So hopefully It'll be cool. good. But uh, what do you say to someone who's on the line? Like, uh, I am, yeah, maybe I'm a Christian. You know, I went to church when I was little. Uh, yeah, my parents were believers, but they're like, they're on the border. Right now, this pandemic is making them scared and all that. What do you say to them? How do you get them across? Yeah, I, you know, for, for me, I, I'm just telling you, like, I go back to what I said about you know, should you do education, you're worth the investment in you, you know, and even if, and I, I mean, I'm a strong believer. I have no doubts that what we're doing is, is the right thing. But even if on the other side, there's nothing, I've lost nothing, you know, and, and if I, and, and, and when I see what I know will happen, I've gained everything. Mm. And I, and, you know, you go through this, it's like, I watched people at our church get frustrated and scared like everybody else. We don't know enough. We don't want, and one lady, uh, you know, just a spiritual hero. Now she's like, listen, God's going to save me either from it in it or through it. And like I can get saved from it and not have it. I can get it. And he's going to save me while I have it, or I'm going to meet him because of the complications or something. She's like, I'm going to be saved. I'm going to be okay. And oh, that's I'm like, a good way. That's what we need is that kind of, you know, faith. It's not, if it weren't for my faith, I'm not, I'm not making it past today. You know, I mean, just, we got to have the, to, to look at God and say, I need you. And he's like, I want you because he doesn't need us, but he wants us. Amen. Now, how can people get a hold of you, Huss? If they yeah, want to book you for a, their company, their church, their event, what can yeah. they do? Yeah, you go to hossridgeway.com. There's a contact there. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. Just type in Hoss Ridgeway. There's really only one on there. And um, if you're on Twitter, it's at Hossage because you've heard of the Ice Age. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're living in the Hoss Age. It was something I did a long time ago. It was silly. But uh, yeah, you can con contact me there, and it's coming to me. I, I get the all the contacts. So. Um, I would love to to uh, to be anywhere. You know, I love doing what I do and sharing this message. So that's awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to be with you in about uh, three weeks, uh, the nineteenth, yeah. the nineteenth right. of uh, February in Franklin, Indiana. We're gonna have a free comedy concert. Uh, you know, two comedians and bring your friends, your neighbors. It's all free. And yeah. just start inviting people. And if you know anybody in that area in Indiana, Ohio, just invite them to the event. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're a busy guy with, with both comedy and ministry. So no problem. I appreciate your time. And we'll see you. I'll see you on the 19th. All right. All see right. You then, bro. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. And you guys, thank you for watching. And I want you to know. 
tonight at 8.30 p.m. and every weeknight on Facebook at Comedian Nazareth, we have the Live with Nash show where we laugh for an hour and at the end of it, we ask you if you have any prayer requests. So 8.30 p.m. tonight and every weeknight, we'll see you on Live with Nazareth under Comedian Nazareth. Please subscribe to this. Please let your friends know. Please share it and uh, we'll see you next week. Next week, uh, on the Laughter for All podcast, we're going to have a, a voiceover actress that's very famous, and you know a lot of her characters, so she's going to be on the show with us, so we'll see you then. Thank you so much, guys, and God bless you, and have a great day.